Hi. One theme that arises from studies of how causality is discussed in health discourse by the general public is a framework of myth-busting. This lightning talk looks at the ways that the debunking of health and nutrition concepts is presented in American English. I show a steady use of speaker one-upsmanship as I examine what we can see about assumptions on the causes of health and illness that are presented as newly discovered information to be added to the common ground. In earlier diachronic work, including my 2011 IELTS presentation, I reported that tropes about catching a cold are evergreen topics in popular culture, with examples of these kinds of repeated myths and counter-myths updating going back to the 17th century in English news and literature. Decade after decade, it's presented as a surprising new finding that, in fact, going out with wet hair or an uncovered head will not lead to catching a cold. This can be seen here by the observation by Pepys in 1664, countered by the observation by Ben Franklin in 1771, and with the myth-busting continuing on through magazine articles and memes into the current century. But catching colds is not the only health myth whose debunking stays in circulation. As the last two examples show, it's a common mechanism in feature reporting to counter your reader or listener's expectations, and this shows up in peer advice as well. Here I'll look at the range of ways that allegedly new information is packaged as, as myth-busting through five mechanisms. These are through meta-discourse myth-framing, through directive speech acts performed directly, such as advising and prohibiting, and by indirect acts by means of behavioral positioning through modals, by appeals to authorities who hold secret knowledge, and most commonly by using corrected expectation markers. These all, I suggest, show up in a continuous cycle of myths and counter-myths used in reporting on causality involving food and illness. I'm pulling these examples from contemporary sources reporting on health issues that are produced by those who are not medical practitioners or medical researchers. So these are primarily materials from Cato, the Corpus of American Discourses on Health. The texts include the genres that you see here, newspaper and magazine articles, columnists and letters to the editor, transcripts of TV and radio interviews, websites and online forums, social media ads, and memes. To start with, written material is sometimes marked as myth information through things like section headings, like we saw in example A, where it's labeled myth of the month, and also in B, myths is starting off as a section heading. And sometimes this is also signaled through article titles, as in C and D. But this can also just be overtly stated in the prose as we see in E. Does greasy oily food cause greasy oily skin? Nope, this is just another myth. At the utterance level, we can find debunking presented as speech acts of advising through commanding or announcing where verbs are overtly used to direct someone to update their knowledge framework, like you see here with forget what you know about eggs, margarine, and salt, or eight great peanut butter benefits we bet you didn't know. But more commonly, these kind of directives are noted not through performative verbs, but via behavioral positioning through modals. We can see these here with you should, you should not, you don't need to, we ought not, and you might not think. Of course, one of the most flamboyant ways of myth busting is through advertising gimmicks, like appeals to authorities who hold secret knowledge. This is demonstrated here with the first two ads that appeared on Facebook, both of which purport to speak for the thoughts of various types of doctors. The bottom three are from contemporary news reporting sites and emphasize the secretness of the knowledge. 
But it's not just internet scams that appeal to elite knowledge, as we'll see in these less flamboyant and more mainstream media examples below. Such as these TV broadcasts that talk about secret knowledge and about things that most people don't realize or most people don't consider, or what many people mistakenly believe. So this is kind of an anti-bandwagon effect that's found when the reader is allowed to join the smaller, in-the-know group. But the most widespread forms of myth-busting are framed with corrected expectation markers, which is what I'm labeling this group of evidentials, discourse markers, and factive triggers, some of which can be seen here. Like, like the word actually, that women with the highest calcium consumption from dairy products actually had substantially more fractures than women who drank less milk. And the notion that you have to overeat a lot of calories in order to gain weight is actually not true. And the uses of in reality. But the reality is that the vast majority of heavy smokers will not get lung cancer. In reality, these drugs are killing people. And uses of, in fact, 90% of Americans are eating more salt than they should, a new government report reveals. In fact, salt is so pervasive that the food supply makes it difficult for most people to consume less. And the fact is, kids are eating fruit because they don't have the option of eating candy. These also show suggestions about newly discovered information that notes what knowledge is current now. Now we know that chocolate has heart-healthy antioxidants. We have discovered that stress cover causes your body to release hormones that raise blood pressure. The last example on this page includes several of these devices. So not so long ago we thought X, but now we know Y. So actually, olive oil is heart-healthy. While there is some recent work on whether myth-busting is effective as an educational tactic in public health campaigns, um, where they found that results varied some depending on the age of the hearer, what I'm showing is the prevalence of informal myth-busting as a way for the general public to communicate with each other about everyday health recommendations. So what we saw is that in lay health discussions, Often, it involves statements about causality and recommendations for action. Given that, it makes them quite useful sites for examining the way that speakers and writers frame their knowledge as types of myth-busting. So we saw that sometimes these occur overtly as discussions about myths or as attempts to reveal and share secret insider knowledge but often they take the form of indirect speech acts via modals that aim to reposition the hearer's behavior and discourse markers that function to correct the hearer's expectations. Now you know the secret techniques by which speakers try to trump their hearer's current knowledge about health. Thank you for listening.